It's often thought that poverty only exists in urban areas, but that's not true. Poverty also exists in rural areas, and I'll tell you more coming up on this episode of The Issues. Stay with us. I'm Sarah Bernard, and thanks for staying with us. According to health.mo.gov, a little more than 5 million rural residents, representing about 12% of the U.S. rural population, live in counties that have high and persistent poverty rates. Just outside of St. Louis, two counties have poverty rates above 20%. Welcome to the issues. Today we're going to focus on poverty in rural areas. The good news is that there is help. Our two guests will share different ways as to how their organizations are assisting. We have Sister Mary Rachel Nervin of Rural Parish Clinic and Chris Schiefer of Bridge of Hope. Welcome both of you. I am yeah. so glad that you're here. This is a really, really important topic and we spent a little bit of time before we turned the cameras on hearing about the work you're doing and I'm just so excited to share this with our viewers. So Sister Mary Rachel, let's start with you. So you um, are working specifically in some of these rural areas around St. Louis. We're going to talk about that, providing medical care and you're a medical doctor. I am. In addition to being a nun. Yes, <laughs> I love indeed. That. So tell us a little bit about the work you're doing and what you're experiencing and what counties you're in. We have two mobile medical, one mobile medical and one mobile dental clinic. So and we are taking these clinics out into five different rural counties surrounding St. Louis area. And we're offering free care, completely free care, to anyone who is uninsured and less than 200% federal poverty level. Um, we set up on Mondays and Thursdays with a medical clinic and see patients from about 9 in the morning until about 1 or 2 in the afternoon. Dental goes out on a monthly schedule and usually parks in an area for 5 to 10 days and they staff as many days as they can and see as many patients as they can fit into those, those days. So tell us about exactly where, which counties you're in? We go as high as Lincoln County. We're in Franklin, Jefferson, Washington, and St. Francis. And how long have you all been doing this? Medical clinic's been out on the road for four years. Dental clinic's been out for two years now. Okay, so four years, and I understand that it was Archbishop Carlson who was here at one point several years ago. He saw this, this need that we had focused a lot on poverty in the city but there was an opportunity in the rural areas. Yes, he did. And he really wanted it to be available to all of the rural counties, not just one of them. And so a brick and mortar clinic was not really feasible. So he built, basically it's a Winnebago, it's an RV mm -hmm. that has two fully stocked um, doctors, suites mm -hmm. with a nurse's station that goes out to each um, location. We have some parishes that we park at, Catholic and non-Catholic parishes um, that welcome us and we see patients there on, on the clinic. And the medical team are volunteers, is that correct? Yes, both medical and dental teams. It's all it's staffed totally by volunteer providers. We have board certified um, physicians and nurses uh, that staff our medical clinic and on the dental side it's uh, licensed doctors and hygienists. Okay and how are people finding out about the clinic to make appointments? So a lot of it is word of mouth and um, we are trying to make headway into these rural communities that we serve working with the ministerial alliances and other organizations like Vincent de Paul, community centers, uh, food pantries, these types of organizations. Health departments have been very good to use us as a referral source. Again, for um, women and men that come to them for issues but don't have health insurance and can't follow up anymore, even at the federally qualified clinics or clinics that charge a sliding scale fee. Those fees get too expensive. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears to Chris because Chris has an interesting story, but you your stories are connected. So you were in Lincoln County up in Troy, yes. just north of St. Louis, and met Chris. So I tell did. us a little, why don't we have Chris tell that story. Tell us how you met, met Sister Mary Rachel and what that led to. So uh, Father Mike just mentioned that the clinic was wanting to come to Troy and would St. Vincent of Paul be able to get patients for them? That's kind of the connection. And you were part of St. Vincent de Paul so, at yes, your parish. Okay. Yes, at our parish. I'm president of our mm -hmm. St. Vincent de Paul. So 
we started uh, inquiring with different people that came in, some of our neighbors, just to see if they had a need. And the need was pretty great. I mean, mm -hmm. we had a lot of people that were in some pain, didn't know where to go. So that's where our connection came in. Mm -hmm. So it's worked great. Okay, great. And how often then, Sister, are you up in the Troy area? We try to service each of the locations at least every other month. Okay. Sometimes it gets pushed out to a month, you know, two and a half months before we can get back there. Okay. So when the clinic came then to the Troy area and you got involved through St. Vincent de Paul, what then transpired to lead you to Bridge of Hope? I want to talk about that and what you're doing. So, so Bridge of Hope has kind of been a dream of I think a lot of places, you know, they want a place to, to put people in need where they can get a hot meal, get a place to stay, but get more than that, get, get the other services. And so Bridge of Hope came out of COVID. Uh, we were being stressed. We were getting so many demands for, uh, not demands, asked. We were asked for shelter and we only had a hotel to put them in. Mm. Hotel rooms get expensive. And once you put them in the hotel, you can't get their other needs met. Mm -hmm. So Bridge of Hope will be a place where we can give them that immediate shelter, give them a hot meal, but yet have they'll have computer access, they'll have a place for NECAC to meet them and Compass Health and Mercy and all of our other partners so that they can get the help that they need to move on. And are you specifically talking about people who are homeless or people who are jobless or both? So it could be both. Mm -hmm. So Bridge of Hope will have two different areas. The one area will be if you need shelter, but we are gonna have a day center which people who don't need shelter can come in, um, say they need, they don't have computer access. Every job you have to get on the computer. Uh, so we're gonna have that. We're also gonna have a laundry facility for the day folks. Um, some people just don't have laundry facilities. So that would, in, uh, they'd have that ability to come in and get cleaned up, even a shower. If they need a shower, they'll be able to take it in the day center. Mm -hmm. So we'll have that, that access, you know, that point that they can come to as well as for the overnight. And know. so Bridge of Hope is going to be a brick and mortar building. Yes. And is it under construction right now? No, we will break ground at the end of this month. Okay. Um, the plans are out for bid right now. It's uh, totally funded. So we're going to be ready to move in. We just have to get all of our programs together. And when do you anticipate that being open? So we're hopeful for the 1st of November. We're gonna to try to push That's the construction. Quick. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. And Very how many, optimistic. how many beds will be there? So we'll be able to house 30 people, uh, men, women, and children. We're gonna have two separate wings to keep them separate. Um, the security and everything's being set up. I know that a lot of people have told us you can't put men and women in the same shelter. We're going to do it. We're going to do it by having enough help to keep them safe. Yeah. What about children? Are you all, especially you, Sister Mary Rachel, experiencing a need of health care and other needs um, for children in our community? Yes. Now, our population that we serve is only adults because okay. every child um, in, in Missouri is uh, eligible for Medicaid. Mm -hmm. The difficulty that we find, however, is that these children grew, these adults now, as children grew up with Medicaid, but there were no Medicaid providers in the rural areas. So it's fine to give them Medicaid, but if there's no providers that accept it, they are not able to get dental care and, and health care. Oftentimes there's more medical care for children than dental. But so, you know, I, I see a 30 year old gentleman who has no functioning teeth anymore. He's never been to a dentist in his life, has never had hygiene in his life from a dental hygienist and really never was taught to brush his teeth or given the supplies of toothbrush and toothpaste to brush his teeth. I mean, this, it's pretty shocking. Yeah, yeah, so, so starting as children then, they have Medicaid but nowhere to go, and Correct. in some cases, no transportation. Correct. So even though they have access, supposedly, they're really, they really don't. Right, and no family structure mm -hmm. to actually make it happen or to, you know, a mother to nag you to brush your teeth. <laughs> right. Especially for, you know, young boys, they don't want to brush their teeth. That's right. <laughs> Nobody does <laughs> when they're young boys, right, or yeah. girls. Right. Um, so, so then, when, what do you then do? What is, uh, you know, what do we do as a community if the, you have these children? Are you directing them? Are you finding, are you helping them find avenues of care? Or are you, is that just really outside of, of uh, what you have the capability to? It's handle? a little bit outside of our scope, mm -hmm. however, 
Sure. Because we are building our social services network, again, partnering with people like what Chris is doing um, up in Lincoln County, we're building this network so that we have an avenue to um, put people into. Mm. So we know what the Medicaid clinics are. We know how to get them an appointment. We can help them enroll for Medicaid if they're not enrolled or re-enroll because if you don't re-enroll every year your child, they fall off the Medicaid system. So we're getting a lot of these services available that we can, we can help our patients navigate. A lot of it is just navigation. Right. Oh, you know, again, ac that is. access to That's internet, um, transportation to get where you need to go, phone access. You know, a lot of our patients just don't have active phones all the time. So and things have, navigation's gotten easier in one sense for mm -hmm. our culture, but if you don't have access right. to technology, it's probably more complicated than ever. It right. It is. So mm -hmm. what gives each of you hope? So I'm sure you're, see you're seeing a difference that you're making. You're excited about the difference that your, your program is right. going to make. What gives you hope for our communities? You know, these, these beautiful interactions we have with patients and the little success stories. But the other thing that brings me a tremendous amount of hope is the beautiful volunteers that come every week to serve patients. Even if we get a small turnout on a day, they come back faithfully every week and they are so kind and so giving, they're very dedicated. This gives me great hope. And these are the medical professionals that are giving their time and, and yes. a time when medical professionals are very busy. Medical and dental. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these people are retired already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're retired and so they're coming back and yes. that's, an, that's awesome. That's an awesome gift to give mm -hmm. back. Chris, what about you? What do you see? What, what gets you excited and hopeful so, for your community? I didn't come from this field. So, you know, having a background as a small business, I really didn't have any idea what I was getting into. But through my work at St. Vincent of Paul, we have 20 to 30 people that on any given Saturday that will volunteer to help meet with people, discuss with them what their needs are. Uh, we can offer rent assistance, hotels, food, you know, whatever. But just seeing all of those folks that are energized and, and want to help people in need, that's what, that's what keeps me going. And, and seeing the joy when you can help somebody, mm -hmm. you know, that, that is really what keeps me inspired. Because just seeing the joy, you know, someone that has no home and they're sleeping in their car, and you tell them, yes, I can put you in the hotel this week because, you know, we want you to get cleaned up. That'll, that'll way you can get refreshed, get ready for a job. You know, they're, they're just so happy. Mm -hmm. you know, it just gives them that one week to get ready to go again. Right. Sister, why do you think we have focused so much on poverty in the urban areas and forgotten our rural communities? Do you see a pattern of why that's happened over the years? I think some of it is because it's not visible. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're driving down the city, in the city of St. Louis, almost at every corner, you see homelessness, you see poverty, people needing things. But in the rural areas, you don't see it. It's very tucked away. Um, these are much smaller cities. The homeless in, in the rural areas don't live on the side of the street. They live in the woods. They live in old abandoned trailers or mobile homes, these type of situations. So I think a lot of it is just it's not visually in front of us. Mm -hmm. Are you still surprised by things that you encounter or not anymore? Very surprised, mm -hmm. very surprised. And I think pleasantly surprised about how engaged people are when they can really finally mm. put down their guard and come and make themselves vulnerable and interact with us. Mm -hmm. um, it's always a joy. Yeah. Chris, do you feel that a not enough attention has been given to the, 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 the poor, the poverty situation in Lincoln County? So yes and no, because I, five years ago, I would have said that we don't have a poverty problem. Hmm. We don't have a homeless problem. But the, when COVID hit and it started, it kind of opened my eyes to where people are living, you know, and now, um, you know, when we go out to visit people and they're living in a tent, and, you know, you can only live in the state park for two weeks. Did you know that? Or they kick you out, even if you're paying. Mm. They don't let you stay longer than two weeks. Well, you know, that's kind of an important place for some of these folks that don't have anything but a tent. Where are they mm. going to put the tent? Mm -hmm. You know, so when, when you start learning some of those things that hinder them from, from just living, it really, 
you know, it really think, it makes you think things need to change. So five years ago, you didn't think there was a problem, and maybe there wasn't as much as there is, like you said, since right. COVID. I think there always has been a problem there, mm -hmm. but I, until you see it and you get someone to open your eyes or, or you visit with someone that's involved in homelessness, mm -hmm. You just, you just can't imagine in the country that we live in that folks live like that. I mean, yeah, I just it, could, I've always had what I needed, you know, and, and we've always, there's always work, you know, and you just think everybody has that until you start really dealing with folks that haven't had the advantages that you had. Yeah, and, and that's why it's important that you're here today to share with our viewers. This is so great. So we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back and we're going to talk about some actual um, community, community members who have benefit, benefited from your services. So we're excited to talk about those, okay. those success stories. So we'll All be right. right back. Stay with us. The Rural Parish Mobile Clinic is up and running, literally on wheels. We have a great team of volunteers who are right there in the heart with the patients. We have every resource available from all three health, Catholic healthcare systems, but we're also able to treat their blood pressure, to treat their thyroid disease, to help them feel better, to treat their chronic pain, their arthritis, so that they're able to get a job, able to get out of bed in the morning, able to feel okay about themselves. We've been able to help uh, patients to think about going on in education. And I'm hoping that our mission can be a prophetic sign of Jesus' presence in the world. It's such a privilege to be able to help people get up on their feet, to be able to improve their health so that they can improve the quality of their life. I am grateful that I have this mission and that this mission extends for the whole church and there's so many people involved, so many great people willing to give their time and their energy to bring health care to the rural poor in the archdiocese. Welcome back. In case you're just joining us, today's topic is on poverty in rural areas surrounding St. Louis. We've heard from, we're talking to a couple of organizations right here who are sharing a lot about what they see and what they're doing on a regular basis. And now we're going to talk about the resolutions and, and how we as a community can help, but first also some particular case studies and how, how these, uh, these folks have helped some people directly in our community. So let's talk about some of your success stories, Sister Mary Rachel. Why don't we start with you and some people that you've helped in our community? We can begin with Amanda. She's a great case study of a, a patient who came to our dental clinic. She's a middle-aged woman and she'd already had a denture for 20 years. And when she came, she had in that denture, five teeth were already missing. It had been overused and used for a long time. She had nowhere to turn. Nobody really helps fix dentures. Uh, so we were able to get her some good care and actually repair her denture. She said when she got her new denture, she had not smiled in 10 years. Oh, wow. Because she was missing teeth in yeah, this denture. Mm -hmm. This also transforms your ability to get a job, to eat healthy food. Um, it, it just transforms your, your whole self-image. Yeah, we don't think about how important our teeth are and our dental mm -hmm. care to self-confidence. Yes. To, like you said, the ability to get certain jobs. Um, eat, all yes. of these things, and we even, take it for granted. Even just the pain and the chronic infection in someone's mouth, when you have these infected teeth and infected gums, it's just chronically weighs on you and it's painful and there's not much you can do. There is no free dental care, um, especially in the rural areas. There's no emergency room for dental emergencies. Mm -hmm. So you're stuck. Mm -hmm. How many patients are you seeing on a regular basis? We. Uh, on the dental clinic, try to get out 12 days a month. Mm -hmm. Last year, we were able to do just over 900 patient visits for both clinics in the year. So we were able to triple our dental volume last year to over 300 patients. And if a patient like Amanda comes in, you're seeing her on a regular basis until her 
her situation is is fixed or repaired. Yes, the real beauty of our clinic is we're really trying to improve the health care outcomes over time of patients. So it's really a continuity care clinic on both sides. It's not just an urgent care. We make appointments with people. On the dental side, they actually do a full evaluation and treatment plan specified for each patient. And then they get to work. It, a lot of it depends on how much work needs to be done in the mouth, how many teeth need to be extracted, how many cavities need to be done. And then the denture process begins, or a partial, if that's needed in, in someone's case. On the medical side, and Yvette's a great case story, we'll talk about how we've been able to help her over time. She um, basically came to us when we started the clinic. Um, and she was in some real trouble with thyroid disease that was unmanaged. She was not able to get thyroid medication and was pretty non-functional, not able to work, not really functioning at home. And by establishing a relationship over time, getting her on the right dose of thyroid medication, we were able to really, she now has a, a great job, has transformed her whole self-image. She's able to interact in public again. Uh, these are these are great stories of how we do uh, chronic disease management over time. Yeah, so Not two very fix. different situations. We had Amanda, and this was Yvette. Who Yvette. You're talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. So, Chris, what about you? What success stories have you seen? So, when I first started, I would have not known that when a kid gets out of foster care, turns 18, he's kind of on his own. Mm -hmm. uh, so we met Daryl, and Daryl came in for food originally. Then we started knowing more about Daryl. Daryl was working two part-time jobs to stay at the hotel. Um, we started inquiring about Daryl. Daryl uh, was diagnosed as mentally handicapped. But the more I talked to Daryl, Daryl was not mentally handicapped. Mm. So Daryl, uh, long story short, he is now working for Troy School District as a custodian, full-time, got full benefits. He lives in his own house, which he pays for. He is going to school at night, no, during the day, I'm sorry, but he's going to have a degree. He's, he's just really, because someone showed him how, you know, he didn't know how. Right. That was a big thing. He, he had to well, be. He, had come, he said he came out of foster care, yes. so he didn't have maybe parents. He who had were, no parents. He never, so he he never got adopted. Adult. He needed adults to help right. him. Right, and we, through our organizations, through St. Vincent of Paul, we were able to connect him with those services mm -hmm. that he could get his ID straightened out. He could get his birth certificate. Mm -hmm. He needed his social security card to go to work for the school. Uh, we got him his, um, all of everything he needed to get to work for school. Yeah. And now he lives in his own apartment. That's He's amazing. so so happy. And how uh, old is he now? He is 22. So in four years, you've, his right. life has been transformed. Right. And he, he also volunteers for St. Vincent Paul every Saturday. Love it. Yeah, yeah, he's just so, it's just changed his life totally. And that's what we hope to do for others, not just youth, but there's a lot of adults that don't have never had that guidance. Mm -hmm. They don't know where to go to get their birth certificate that they lost. Mm -hmm. Most homeless don't have a birth certificate. You have to have that to work. Yeah. You know, so mm -hmm. that's what we hope Bridge of Hope will provide. Yeah. So by Bridge of Hope will be the first step. And, that, and now the second step will be affordable housing which we're trying to get through Catholic Charities help, uh, some affordable housing started in Lincoln County. So first will be this build, the first building that's breaking ground in the next month or so, and then you'll be adding some housing then, after yes, that. Yes, then we'll be adding housing. Yes, so. I love goals. I mean, yeah. yes, I love this. Okay, <laughs> Sister Mary Rachel, what about you? What's next for you all? Well, we already serve in five counties. We do need to still get the medical van up to Lincoln County, only mm -hmm. the dental van services okay. up there. But our goal is we're, we're exploring St. Genevieve County. We've had some um, of the agencies there approach us, some of the, um, just the city agencies, as well as the healthcare providers there who realize there is this gap for people with no insurance. So we're looking towards St. Genevieve. But our goal really is to reach out to every single rural county associated with the archdiocese that could use our service. Yeah, so lots of expansion opportunities, lots of nice. lots of need for sure for lots both for both of you. So uh, we have about a minute left. Tell us how people can find you to get involved, both from a patient standpoint and then certainly from a volunteer standpoint. If there's an opportunity there, sister, our website, which is www.archstl forward slash rpc for rural parish clinic, is available for patients. It tells you where we're located. You can sign up available for volunteers. We definitely need more volunteers to continue to serve all of these communities and for donations as well. 
to pay for the supplies that we need, gas, all of those things. And so volunteers, um, specifically doctors and dentists or other, and nurses, or the community as well? We need clinical and non-clinical volunteers. Okay. So even if you've never served in the medical or the dental world, we still need you. We need help with marketing, PR, all of this outreach work, website development, all of everything. Lots of opportunity. That's Lots. fantastic. All right, we'll get you some people. Thank We're you. We're going to try on that. Thank Chris, you. what about you? How can we help you? So um, if you go to bridgeofhopelc.org, um, you can find all the things that we're doing, where we're at, uh, what the jobs are that are going to be available. Our staff will be pretty well a hired staff, but we will have volunteers like in the kitchen and in cleaning, maybe in the landscape, you know, to keep the place up kept. Um, also, we're going to need people to come forward and help help us meet our goals of, of keeping this shelter running. So. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you both so much for being here today thank and you. sharing all of this. I mean, our, everyone's eyes are open to, from everything that you've shared today. So we appreciate you both being here, Sister Mary Rachel and Chris, and what you're doing to help poverty in the rural areas. And hopefully this will help some of our viewers as well. So I'd like to also say thanks to each and every one of you who tune into the issues and share your comments. And just wanna remind everyone that you too can join the discussion. Be sure to check us out online and on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget to download the free STL TV app. Be sure to tune into our next edition of the issues where we'll have another informative topic that you definitely don't want to miss.